least four hours, 400 milliamps for at least four hours, and 15 microamps for at least 40 hours in a 48 hour period of no sunlight. That allows um, our customer to be in the sleep mode uh, with the microprocessor for the majority of the time, 20 hours a day, very low power, only requires 15 microamps, 3.3 volts. It allows him to run either just the processor or just a Wi-Fi card at 400 milliamps for four hours, and also allows him to run both his microprocessor and his Wi-Fi card, which is the 400 times two, which is 800 milliamps for four hours within that 48 hour period. And of course, the battery issue needs to be able to last at least five years. You never know what the conditions are going to be, how many discharge cycles you're going to have when you uh, are recharging these batteries, what your demand is going to be, but based on what your estimate we're going to have over the course of um, uh, providing our uh, power, we need uh, nicotinic batteries because they have up to 500 discharge and recharging cycles. So if you pick a battery that has a high number of discharge and recharge cycles, you get approximately the length of time it's going to last. With a very robust battery can be recharged constantly, like in old cadmium, we estimate that we will be able to move this back and last for five years without replacing batteries. All right, give you an overall um, block diagram of our system here. Basically, if you look to the left, you've got your solar panels. We have seven 0 0.5 5 volt solar panels, which are matched up to a battery pack of four batteries. So we have four different kind of batteries, two in series and parallel with two in series. Each of these batteries is 1.2 volts. Well, you say to yourself, that's only 2.4, so why do I have seven times 0 0.55 volts? Well, very simple, is that when you charge these batteries, you're gonna charge them at approximately 1.8 volts each per the series, so that's 3.6 volts. Uh, we match them as close as we can, given the uh, industry standards of solar panels available, and that allows us to explain why we have the grade we do. All right. You see two um, one and mega ohm resistors right there in uh, parallel with the batteries. The point to this is they, they pull down the voltage to an acceptable range where you could input that into any AV converter. Not necessarily our AV converter, but it could also be an AV converter on our customers' electronics. We provide an AV converter if, they, um, if there's enough I squared C connectors, which is the output uh, configuration of our AV converter on their electronics. They can take our digital signal, monitor our battery capacity, and that allows our customer to know what exactly our operating conditions are like right now. How much longer can we provide power in the absence of sunlight? Are our batteries full? Are we at a full bucket of charge? Are we nearing the end? And if you're nearing the end, you want to have the understanding of how much longer you have so that your camera doesn't simply just shut off. It gives you estimating purposes for how long you're able to go. Uh, and pull down resistors allow us to also give an analog output as well as a digital output um, if they have their own uh, visual electronics to monitor the digital electronics. The DC DC converter is simply our choice for regulating um, our voltage. Whatever we give it in, it steps it up to uh, 3.3 volts. 2.4 is what our batteries are going to have at full um, capacity. We get it up to 3.3. That allows us to stay within our range for the uh, 9 volt 200 processor. Really All right. Basically, functionality of where our project stands at the moment at ECE day. We are not 100% functional due to a flaw in our um, credit circuit board. And basically what that means is that after debugging, we realized that two pins, two duplicate pins for uh, ground and power out exist on the PCB. We thought that we could leave it open and not have any issues. Well, it turns out, the manufacturer recommends that you keep these pins soldered together. And if you solder it together, you won't have any problems. You'll be able to get that full regulation of the DC DC converter. Without them soldered together, what happens is that your DC DC converter, the output voltage, simply follows the input voltage you give it. So it's essentially not regulating anything. We have a completed design ready for fabrication. We can send this design out within a matter of days. We can have a fully functional PCB. It's just an issue of having to solder them together by hand is a very tedious process, nearly impossible, something we would never recommend to be done for a customer. So our recommendation is to send this out and get it re fabricated. We would have a fully functional Next slide. All right, tell a little bit about the two um, cornerstone uh, components of our electronics here, A to D converter and DC DC converter. I'll talk about the A to D converter. This is, like I said, how we're going to give a signal to our customer to monitor our battery capacity, give them an idea of how long we can give them power. Basically, it's a max of 1363 A to D converter, 12-bit um, signal. Um, it's I squared C compatible, which means it works with pretty much any microprocessor. I'm not sure I'm going to remember Mr. Alex. All right, I'm going to go over the selection of the DC-DC converter. 
this is a big part of the project because the most important thing is that we're able to power the device we're supposed to power. The biggest feature is that it's a three-point remote clean signal, and by clean I mean it doesn't fluctuate more than 100 milliamps one way or the other. Um, it also needs to be able to provide appropriate current. It needs to be able to provide up to one amp to safely ensure that there's 800 milliamps available to our customer at all times. Um, there are a lot of DC-DC computers to choose from. Uh, the first and foremost selection was voltage, fluctuation, and possible current. And we're still talking about thousands of DC-DC converters. What I did is I looked at the DC-DC converters used for cell phones, because if you think of it, our operation isn't that much different than a cell phone. Providing power to a chip over a long period of time is a low power operation. And what we ended up settling on was the Max 1763. It's a 3.3 volt uh, adjustable output. Oh, it's all right there. Let's take a second to take a look. Okay, I'll now go over the printed circuit board design. The main goals were that everything was on a single PCB board for a basic connection. We wanted enough terminals to power all the devices necessary, that is the iMode, the Wi-Fi card, and our own um, AV converter. We decided to go with mostly through hole because they're easier to work with with the tools we have. And uh, one of the goals for cost was designing using two or fewer layers. I needed two, and this would be good. This is the schematic of the uh, PCB. Most of what's here is just taken directly from the manufacturer's website as the recommended circuits. Um, the schematic's pretty simple. The only thing that uh, that might be confusing is the individual circuits, but they're, they're directly from the manufacturer's website. The layout uh, was relatively simple, so I decided to do it manually. Um, one of the important things, especially for the Max 1763, was to keep the components as close to the uh, chip as you could, and a lot of the control components you see there are like that. Oh, the uh, plug that my colleague pointed out earlier, these pins right there on the bottom right hand corner, they're now corrected in the final design. And this is a picture of the finished PCB board. Uh, easy. 